This is Harper's Ferry. And that's the Potomac. That's the Shenandoah. I think it's called St. John's Episcopal Church. down on the town of Harper's Ferry. may look just like any other field, but what you've been seeing is Antietam Battle Site. We're in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Unknown soldiers' graves. Just numbered. The site of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address.
The Illinois guys are right over there under those trees. You want to go see them? Sure. Let's go what? check them out here. here uh, I think we can get out down this way maybe. Come. Get rid of that. He goes this way. I discovered a trainer, Charles Trainer, killed in the Battle of Gettysburg. Our Confederate soldiers who have surged to the high watermark of the Confederacy. For two days on both sides of us, over the bright green pastures, in the yellow fields of wheat, in the woods, among the rocky hills, in the town itself, the battle has rolled and thundered with no decision. But now, these men have driven straight through the center of the Union line and almost to where you were standing. That clump of trees in the foreground was the target. The aiming point to which General Robert E. Lee had chosen to guide the center of his attacking forces. This clump of trees and many other features of the landscape are still to be seen today. On the day of the discharge, the Union line ran from the round house, which you see there on the left in the spot. Past the common trees and along the crest of the ridge of Rome. But as you see it going on in line after line of battle, it was Pickett's division and march of two other divisions, men of Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, moving steadily with the crimson flags of the Confederacy flashing above them in the sun. They were under Union artillery fire most of the way. And as they passed those Kazori buildings and came up the slope in front of you, the Union artillerymen changed to cannons. Cans of iron balls fired like giant shotgun shells and tearing ranks apart with a hail of death. So by now, as you see them, the regular formations of Confederate brigades and regiments have almost disappeared, and they have come up the slope simply as bunches and swarms of men and flags, with men falling, flags falling, but flags being picked up again and coming on. And now, in several places, they have broken through the Union infantry, while in other places, Union men are still open. This part of the Union line in front of you had been mainly defended by artillery, the six guns of Cushing's battery, but the battery has been all but destroyed. One of the caissons is blowing up. Guns are being hauled away. Lieutenant Cushing himself, the officer in the white vest by the cannon near the yellow flag, has been mortally wounded. Nevertheless, Pickett's charge is nearly over. Union men from Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, men from Delaware, Ohio, Michigan, and Minnesota are closing in, firing on Pickett's men from front and flank. Looking to your left, you can see a man on a black horse just crossing the road. That is Major General Winfield Hancock, and he is ordering up more troops. Right in front of him, the 72nd Pennsylvania is rushing to the attack, while all to the rear of us and around us, other Union forces are coming up. Directly ahead of you, by the red flags just right at the top of trees, Louis Armistead, the Confederate general who led the attack over the stone wall, is falling with a fatal wound. Falling among those tangled knots of men, fighting in their last desperate efforts through a smoky haze of fear and fury, fighting with club muskets and bayonets. Pickett's Charge, one of the most courageous in military history, has run its course to a high watermark of valor and devotion. And of those who came across that field, two out of three will not return with the remnants that will soon go streaming back toward the distant forest. The men of Pickett's Charge have lost today, but all who fought here, north and south, gained imperishable glory.
It is mostly people. Trees is Seminary Ridge. 12,000 men charged across this open field at Pickett's Charge on July the 3rd, 1863. Up to that point, those trees, that line of trees that you see right there, that was as far as they got. This is where they were stopped by the Union forces. Now, you see big round top, and then next to that dome building is the little round top, and all along here, out in front of me here, this is Cemetery Ridge. effectively changed the direction of the Civil War. After this battle of Gettysburg, the South never was of much prominence again, and the North slowly but surely wore them down and won the war. C Cemetery Ridge was Meade's headquarters. It's a little building. It's still standing right there. Don't know if we'll get down to it or not. Top Culp's Hill, what you're seeing is the big round top. And then down to Cemetery Ridge. City of Gettysburg. We're coming. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, okay. I'm right here. Is that what you're doing? Okay, we'll keep going. It's, it's hard for me to do it from the front. On the morning of July 2nd, Lee ordered General Longstreet to occupy Seminary Ridge in front of you, and from it, to attack the Union left, which Lee believed was in the fields below. To aid this main attack, Confederate forces would also assault the Union positions on Coke's Hill and Seminary Hill, two miles to your right. Shortly after noon, you had a lot Looking down at the Devil's Den and Seminary Ridge from the top of Little Round Top. Now heading, looking down toward Cemetery Ridge. And to my immediate left, over the top of that cannon, and those trees you see right above the, the barrel of the cannon, that's Big Round Top.